morning, everyone, and good morning, Sir Stanley uh, Wells and uh, Paul Edmondson from the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, renowned Shakespeare scholars. Delighted to be welcoming you to St John's House and in this magnificent sort of hall uh, this morning to talk about your new book, um, all the Shakespeare sonnets. Uh, but before we start, a, um, it might be quite nice to. Um, find out a bit more about sort of yourself. So maybe, Paul, could you introduce Stanley for us? Professor Sir Stanley Wells is the world's leading Shakespeare scholar. He's honorary president of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. He's published many books and articles. Uh, he was employed in the late 1970s by Oxford University Press to produce a brand new edition of Shakespeare which he did do, and then that transpired that it was into separate volumes of Shakespeare plays. Stanley's the only person to have presided over a multi-volume Shakespeare, as well as a Shakespeare complete works from scratch. Okay. Um, and he is a teacher and a man of great wisdom and a collaborator uh, of some years with me. And this is not the first time we've written about Shakespeare's sonnets, but we're delighted to have done so again in a completely brand new way. Oh, brilliant. Oh, we have got some esteemed company with us this uh, morning. Uh, Stanley, could you say a few words about uh, Paul? Yeah, Dr Paul Edmondson is Head of Research at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. He's a distinguished Shakespeare scholar, renowned uh, all over the world, actually, for his appearances at Shakespeare conferences, and, of course, nowadays also online with, with other uh, events of that sort. He is the author of several solo authored books about Shakespeare, including one on Twelfth Night, including one with the simple title of Shakespeare for Profile Books, and he and I have collaborated uh, significantly for this event in 2004. Paul and I published a book about Shakespeare's sonnets, which is a study, not an edition, but a study of Shakespeare's sonnets, published uh, by Oxford University Press. Uh, we often lecture about Shakespeare's sonnets, and we uh, collaborated, obviously, on this book here, All the Sonnets of Shakespeare. The title of the book is significant. It's not just Shakespeare's sonnets, it's all the sonnets of Shakespeare. And shall we explain why? Right, oh, fantastic to, to have you here this morning. So I'd like to start off with Paul saying, do we need another book on Shakespeare's sonnets? We do, because this approach has never been made before. It's entirely original. It's groundbreaking, we hope. Why is it groundbreaking? Mm. Because for the first time ever, we've, as Stanley mentioned a moment ago, we've put all the sonnets of Shakespeare together in one volume. So in 1609, there was published a book, Shakespeare's Sonnets, never before imprinted. It contained 154. Our book contains 182 sonnets. Because we've gone to Shakespeare's plays and we've extrapolated the sonnets which appear in them and we've sorted the whole 182 out into chronological order which has never been done before, which means that the book gives you an overview of Shakespeare as a writer of this extraordinary poetic form over about 30 years in his career. Right, Stanley, do you think that, what have you learned more about Shakespeare as by doing this particular way of a, uh, presenting Shakespeare? Yes, I think, I think we've learned a lot more about Shakespeare, partly about his artistry, about the fact that he uh, employed this poetic form of the sonnet, which is of course an ancient poetic form going back to the 13th century, uh, but had been used in England by a number of solitaires before he was writing. And we learned that he was able to, uh, to use this solid form for a variety of speeches in the plays, including formal speeches like the prologue uh, to Romeo and Juliet uh, and, and epilogues to but also that he uses the sonnet form for a very wide range of personal utterances, some of them very intimate. And this leads us to, I think, a much greater knowledge of Shakespeare's personality, and especially of his sexuality. Uh, the sonnets are very revealing about that. If we take it, as I do take it, as I do believe, that these are very personal utterances, that he's writing here from the heart, uh, look in your heart and write, says Wordsworth about the sonnet, and Shakespeare is doing that. Some of the sonnets are more formal than others. Uh, some of them are uh, public, or, or, or might call almost public poems. 
but others are very private explorations of his own personality and indeed of his sexual identity. Right, right Paul, who do you think these uh, sonnets were aimed at was, in terms of their gender? Was Shakespeare writing to a woman, a man? Can you say something about that? So one of the things that we have hope we've put paid to in our new book, and we've exploded a few myths about Shakespeare's sonnets in producing this book, is a story which latched onto them around about the end of the 18th century by a very great scholar, Edmund Malone, started the ball rolling. And he brought a story to these poems. And he suggested that the first 126 were addressed to a fair youth. This is not the case. It's not the case because not every single sonnet is addressed to a person. Right. And, and, and our book makes this really clear. Um, if I just find where we've uh, written about this, there's a, a, a on page uh, 29. So out of the 154 sonnets published in 1609, only 121 of them are addressed to people, 84 of which could, either to, could be up to either a male or a female. Um, and six sonnets are addressed to abstract concepts, such as time or love or to the muse. And 25 are personal meditations. They're like miniature soliloquies. So when you admit that, which is perfectly true, that completely disables the story, which for about over two centuries has trapped these poems into a predetermined narrative, and a dark lady is mentioned along the way as well. Right. She doesn't properly exist in quite the way that many critics want yeah. her to. So by putting them into chronological order, not only have we moved that myth in terms of changing the order, it was never there to begin with. So as Stanley said a moment ago, this has been very revealing then, that although um, biographical interest has been brought to the poems through the stories that we've been telling ourselves about them for centuries, by removing that predetermined story, we've actually revealed their personality more. Oh, so right. in a weird way, in a very clear way to us, mm -hmm. paradoxically, their personality, their personhood, Shakespeare's identity, Shakespeare's DNA in these poems is revealed more through our approach. Right, Stanley, taking that theme, do you think that we might have lost something by not having these sonnets in the context in which they were written and having them as freestanding? Uh, no, I think we've gained a great deal by putting them into the order uh, that, they, that, that they were composed in. We, we learn, for example, that Shakespeare was writing sonnets as a young man, as a very young man. Uh, at school, I believe, that the last two printed sonnets are both translations of a Latin poem, and surely the obvious time for Shakespeare translating from Latin would be at school, and especially as one of them revises the other which suggests a schoolmaster saying, now, William, this is not quite right. Why don't you rephrase it like this? The next one that we include in our collection is the one printed as number 145 Five, yeah. in the original, in the 1609 collection, which was written clearly when Shakespeare was only 18, because it's a wooing solid. It's addressed to Anne Hathaway. It puns on her name. Now, this was only realised in 1971, when a distinguished Shakespeare scholar, a friend of ours called Andy Gurr, uh, wrote about this, which is an example of how understanding of the sonnets has been very slow, and we believe we've, we've added to, to it considerably. I just add to that and say that whatever we've done here, and we're very clear about what we've done and why we've done it, nothing is going to take away the 1609 ordering of these remarkable poems, which we, which we believe to have been almost certainly Shakespeare's own ordering of the poems. As a poet orders an anthology, it seems that you know, an ordering mind was at work. They, they don't tell a story, they never have, but they, and they, they're not a sequence of poems, but they're a collection, they're an anthology. And it seems to us that because there are pairs of poems through the collection, that, that on 19 occasions, Shakespeare's writing a sonnet, then writing a sequel to it, um, that there are, they are connected by some runs of sonnets within the collection, are connected by theme. Our ordering actually doesn't disrupt that. They stay together as, 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 as uh, in the chronology. But what I am saying is that the ordering of 1609 is not going to go anywhere, whatever, whatever the world brings to these poems, but we're the first ones to do what we've done, and it's a really fresh approach. And it, and it completely makes us think again about Shakespeare's sonnet project. And about his personality, yeah. very much so. Mm, how, how interesting. Um, 
some of the some some of the summaries of the sort of content of the sort of poems, the sort of sonnets are quite light hearted. Um, did you have a particular audience in mind in terms of how to present, represent the, the, the sonnets? An example, maybe, if I could, could, could just say, um, I'm sort of looking at the um, sonnet here, which begins, I, I am awake all night thinking of you, but that's because of my love for you rather than your love for me. You're probably off enjoying yourself with others, um, is there anything in terms of being sort of light-hearted and who the audience might be for this particular book? We seem to try to reflect the tone of the sonnet itself. And some of the sonnets are quite light. The sonnets themselves are quite light-hearted. Shakespeare was a great wit, a great comic writer, and there are traces of that in the sonnets. What this does reflect is, is, is the fact that at the foot of each sonnet, we do print a summary. It's an attempt to help the reader. Just as we also print at the back of the book, in order to try to help the reader, complete paraphrases into modern English prose of each sonnet and each extract from the plays that we, that we include in this volume. I'll explain, maybe if I may, the reason why we in decided to include those two things. Um, we felt that our job was to make these poems as understandable as possible, because we looked at previous editions of the sonnets, and they never actually tell you what the poems mean. They'll gloss certain words and they'll compare certain words to how they're used elsewhere by Shakespeare in the plays and so on. But when you're looking about what a line means or a phrase, no, no help for you. And I was talking to a friend of ours, Devon Glover, who spends his time producing rap versions of Shakespeare's sonnets and goes into lots of schools in North America and, and, and across Europe as well. And he said that when he was at school, he remembers at the foot of the page the briefest of possible summaries, just letting you into the tone of the poem. And I said to Devon, I think that's a really good idea. So I brought that idea, idea to you, Stanley, because we were saying, as we were working on these poems, you kept saying, these poems are so difficult. And I said, Stanley, if you and I think that, what, are our, what about our readers? Mm -hmm. So we thought, definitely somebody's at the foot of the page. And Greg Doran, the artistic director of the RSC, when he read the book, he said he loved the summaries because you can flip through and think, oh yes, I think I, think I fancy one of those, and then read the poem itself, and it just lets you in. And then the paraphrase at the back gives you a fuller explanation of the actual kind of literal meaning, which if you read a series of the paraphrases, it lets you into how Shakespeare's mind is working in, in modern prose. How, how long did it take you both to uh, produce this book, sort of from the original idea, let's basically put all the sort of sonnets together, uh, to when it's been sort of published by Ox, uh, Cambridge University Press? About three years. We worked on it. Uh, on and off, of course, we had other things to do while we were doing it, but it, the, the project itself is, is roughly three years in, in, in extent. And it was delightful to work on as a collaboration because we, we produced, for example, a paraphrase. We'd alternate, we'd, working on different paraphrases, and we'd bring the paraphrase to each other on a piece of paper and check each other's paraphrase and say, well, what about this line here? What about? And, and similarly with the sonnet itself, with the glosses at the foot of the page, how is this Stanley, how is this Paul? And we would, we would correct and we would advise and we would talk about each sonnet that we'd both been working on. Well, so it's very much a, a, a collaboration in that sense. So that with the introduction, yeah. the book has an introduction of about, I think it's about 14,000 words, and we wrote versions of it and then revised each other's work uh, and included some of the new thoughts that we were having as we wrote the book. So it's a, it's a very genuine work of collaboration. Oh, fantastic. Um, are you sort of working on any sort of endeavours at the moment, or sort of in terms of collaborating? What's your next uh, book that you're working on? Stanley. Well, I'm working on uh, editing the lectures that I gave for, to celebrate, if that's the word, my 90th birthday, which were commissioned by the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, which were to have been given uh, in public uh, in Stratford. Because of the pandemic, in fact, they were given online which means that they've reached a very great deal more, a great, very great many more people than they would originally have done. So that's a, that's a rather mixed blessing. Uh, and I'm preparing those four lectures, which are under the general title of what was Shakespeare really like, and preparing those for publication as a little book. And I may say one of the lectures is what do the sonnets tell us about Shakespeare? So that extends the work that we've done in this book. 
Um, how do you, what about you, Paul? What are you working on? Well, I have in mind a book with the original title, Shakespeare and Stratford upon Avon, mm-hmm. but no one will have taken the approach that I've taken before. And I want to be able to turn that book into, as it were, an open research project and uh, ask audiences and take the book as it's developing to audiences online and, and share my research as I go along. Um, so I have that in mind as a, as a next project, which I'm quite excited about. When did you first come across sort of public libraries in your sort of, uh, in your sort of uh, upbringing, sort of maybe poor from, from you? Sure. Um, there is a very special place in my heart for public libraries. As I, I, you and I have talked about this before, Abe, I'm sure. Um, when I was a, a teenager growing up in York, I, w- I discovered somehow that the public library had audio discs of gramophone records of Shakespeare plays. And when I'd started studying Shakespeare at school, I thought, oh, I'll go and borrow Macbeth from the public library, which I did. I took it home to, uh, took it home and recorded onto cassette tape in those days, uh, Macbeth. And it was, I sat there with my complete works, not Stanley's, it hadn't been, hadn't been published by then, um, open in front of me. Um, and I found it was a really good way of getting to know Shakespeare's works. And so for quite a few weeks over the next two or three years, I'd cycle into your, go to the public library, 60 pence per disc to hire, mm. often three discs, so one pound 80, take it home, listen to the play, record it, read it with my complete works. And that's how I got to know Shakespeare. It was public libraries at the bottom of my heart that helped to turn me into a Shakespearean. Why? Because it just allowed me to uh, have access to something which I wouldn't have had access to. And I, I, I think... Um, therefore, public libraries and Shakespeare uh, are, are very much wedded in my own sense of who I am and how I was formed. And as, uh, as we're delighted that in the Stratford Library, um, on, on the first Saturday of every month, for the last two years, though not at the moment, we'll get it back in 2021, we have a public reading group called Shakespeare for All, which um, gathers together people to read Shakespeare's plays. And Stanley, you and I help present that, don't yes, we? Yes, we've been co-presenting this for, for, for quite a while now. And public libraries have meant a very great deal to me too. I came from a house in which, a home in which there were no books. My parents were not readers. Oh, yeah. And so the public library in Hull meant a very great deal to me. Uh, I used to, like Paul, I used to borrow records, in my case, particularly records of classical music, because it had a record section. I remember particularly borrowing a record of Chrysler and Zimbalist playing box double violin concerto on a, I think it was a 12 inch disc that you had in those days. And then later, when I moved slightly out of Hull into a, a suburban uh, village, I, I belonged to the library there. And, and would, would, would borrow books. I could use the school library by then, the grammar school library, but the public library kept on meaning a lot to me in my, in my intellectual development. Oh, fantastic. Basically, Paul, could you read us uh, one, of the, one, of, one of your sonnets that you've chosen? Well, I've chosen one from the plays, and some years ago, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, in partnership with Warwickshire Libraries, decided for National Poetry Day that we were going to involve local schools to write poems and hang them on the railings outside Shakespeare's birthplace. And we did this for a number of years. It was a lovely project. What inspired that project was this sonnet, a foreshortened sonnet from um, As You Like It, of, of, of the lover Orlando running through the forest of Arden and hanging his verses on trees. From As You Like It, Act 3, Scene 1. And we contextualise all the sonnets from the plays at the foot of the page. So we, it, this one reads, Orlando, loves sick for Rosalind, hangs on trees in the forest of Arden, poems addressed to her. His speech describing this takes the form of a foreshortened sonnet as he runs eagerly away. Hang there my verse, in witness of my love, and thou thrice crowned queen of night, survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above thy huntress's name that my full life doth sway. O oh, Rosalind, these trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts I'll character that every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, and unexpressive she. Oh, brilliant, lovely. Thank you for that, Paul. Uh, and what about you, Stanley? Yeah, this is, uh, I, I want to read Song of 29, which means a lot to me. It, it's, it's, it's what I, I learned when I was a teenager. Uh, I, 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 it was at a time of emotional awakening uh, 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 of love and friendship. So it's, it's the one that begins, When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcasts, 
state, untroubled deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least, yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, Happily, I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Okay, thank you, Stanley, for that. And thank you both, gentlemen. What a uh, great morning that we've had talking about your new book. It's available in local bookshops, but also uh, the library service. I've got lots of copies, so you can sort of borrow it from uh, any good library service. And we've got plenty in Warwickshire libraries. Thank you both. Thank you, Abe. Thank you.